1 Peter 2. And once again, for uh, reference and background information, we discussed last week that, that Peter was writing this to the Jewish, remember our Jewish church, Jewish Christians. Uh, that always sounds funny when you say Jewish Christians, but Jewish people that follow Christ. And we're going to move forward. This week, I, my Bible entitles this section as, uh, as newborn babies, right? And we're just going to kind of move through to the next, next because it also lists as living stones, right? So we're going to talk about what's going on, what Peter's next section. Last week, anybody remember what we talked about? Peter was telling us that we're what? Sanctified. Sanctified and that we're aliens, right? Because of our sanctification, we are part of the world, but we no longer belong to the world. And instead, we are set apart, and we're set apart by the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are set apart, we should act in, act in certain ways and, and respond in certain ways. And he's kind of set that up first. Because until you believe and realize that you are sanctified, can you truly walk? What do y'all think? Do you think not, being, not having the, the mental thought of I am sanctified by Christ, can we walk if we forget that? You can't because Satan reminds you what? And you ain't good enough. But we are. because Not because of who we are, but because God said what? You're good enough. Is that something hard for you? Did y'all have to wrap your mind around that when you become a Christian? Or am I the only one that struggled with that? That idea that I'm sanctified not because of who I am, but because Jesus said that I'm sanctified. You know, you still have, Satan still uses, that's a tool that Satan uses. The idea that magically you are to be perfect when you're never going to be perfect. And then when you're not perfect, you say, how can I be sanctified and holy? But God says you're sanctified and holy because I say you're sanctified and holy. It's kind of like your parents, right? Don't do as I say, not as I do. Did anybody get told that when you was a kid? That never made any sense, did it? But basically what God's saying is that you're sanctified because I said it. Because what I say goes. Because when God speaks, things happen, Right? In the Word of God, Genesis, it says, the Lord spoke, what? Everything into existence. So just because He says it, that means it's true. Now, you try to convince people of that, and people don't want to believe that, because that's just how we're, we're programmed. So Peter wanted to start the foundation by saying what? You're sanctified. You are set apart. You are no longer the people that you used to be. So we see in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore, anytime you see a transition of therefore in the Word of God, what does it mean? What is coming after is the result of what came before. So because you are sanctified and because you are aliens and because you no longer belong to the world, because you are differentiated and set apart, therefore... We're going to see what that means, right? Therefore, something else is going to happen. Basically, this is what he's saying. Since you went to the refrigerator and got out the ham and the bread and the mayonnaise and the cheese, therefore, you are going to make a sandwich, right? Meaning, you gathered the stuff in the first, and now that you have it, you're going to what? Now use it. Make you, <laughs> make you a sandwich. Now, y'all might not like that sandwich, but anyway, that's how you would, therefore, right, I am going to do something else. That used to be that SAT prep. Y'all remember, remember the SAT prep? Isn't the hardest thing on the SAT is when they do that whole, if you have this, statements, you know what I mean? Y'all know what I'm talking about. What they call them, Megan? Word problems. Yeah, it's like cause and effect stuff. It's just like you're going, what? Because then they get to the weird stuff that doesn't make any sense. The other thing in college that really freaked me out was... When you have a question with four right answers. And you have to pick the best right answer. That took me forever to get my brain wrapped around the idea of the best right answer. It's right though. I remember I argued with a professor. But it's right. He's like, no, it's wrong. I said, no, it is right. No, it's wrong. No, it's wrong. <laughs> Tell me it's right. He's like, yeah, it's right. And then he finally goes, but I was looking for the best right answer. And I'm going, ugh. That's beside the point. Anyway, therefore, 
putting aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Okay, what we have to realize here, you know, the word of God, we're going to hear Peter say later on in another place, in another passage, that we have to learn to eat the meat, not just the milk. And many people believe that he's contradicting himself here when he says what? Long for the pure milk. But we have to pay attention to the audience that Peter was talking to. Because the people Peter was talking to was new converts to Christ, right? Meaning there had never been before. Y'all do realize that, right? These people have never been saved. This is a first time salvation. And there was no proof of how to live. That's why Peter had to write them letters to tell them how to live. So he is comparing them to what? Newborn babies. Prime example. What do newborn babies drink? What's your baby drink? Milk. Right? Mountain Dew. <laughs> and Budweiser. We, we, we switched we switch that. Milk, right? Because that's what they can process at that age. Could you get that baby steak? No, he ain't got no teeth to chew it. They got to have what? Milk. So to a newborn baby, we can't give steak. We have to have what? Milk. And it says pure milk, meaning what? Milk of the highest quality. So we see here that he says, Therefore, since you are set apart and sanctified by Christ, which we talked about before, since we are aliens, since we do not long, no longer belong to the world, we have to start over. Does that make sense? You remember Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to be what? Born again. We talked about that statement last week. So he had to be born again. So if I was born again spiritually... I don't come out spiritually grown, so I have to do, to do what? Eat spiritual food. So that's what he's saying. Therefore, putting aside. What does it mean to put aside? Basically it means to leave it alone, right? And you're putting it out of sight. He said, put aside all malice. What's the word malice mean? Hatred. Ooh, that's hard, isn't it? Because no matter how, how hard you strive as a human... This separates us. That's what he's saying. This separates you. This makes you aliens to this world when you can set aside hatred. Because it's hard. There's always somebody you hate, isn't there? Everybody say amen. amen. I'm human. There's been people that you just despise. And what he's saying here first and foremost is if you're going to be sanctified, if you're going to be called one of mine, the first thing you have to do is you have to put off what? Hatred. Why do you think you started with hatred? Because the foundation of your Christian life is love. And can love stand where there is hatred? And the Word of God says that if you do not love your brother, then you don't love me. So if you're a Christian that is living with hatred, you have to eradicate that and put that aside because it cannot stand in the face of who? Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of Christians' lives are ruined by the hatred. And I'm going to tell you, the people you hate, they're not losing sleep in. You're losing sleep at night. They're not affected by your pain. You're affected by your pain. So why do we want to hang on to it? Are we getting anything out of it? I heard somebody say the other day that they, they didn't panic because panicking doesn't fix the situation. That's kind of like hatred. You have hatred in your heart, but it doesn't fix anything. Hatred makes the, the situation instead what? Worse for you. And God said you can put it aside because you are what? Sanctified. So we no longer hate because we turn that hate over to who? Christ. That might mean Christ. I'm going to tell you, pray. if you have somebody in your heart that you hate, pray for them. Not pray that God kills them. I know that's what y'all think. I'll pray for them, all right? I'll pray their children go bald-headed. Right? Nothing like that. Pray instead that God blesses them. Try it. That's hard, but try it. God bless them so it changes who they are. Because deep down, that person that you hate is a product of the world. Because true Christians do not act that way. Make sense? So we change them by changing what? Who they are in us, right? They come to know Christ, it changes who they are. We've, we try to fix too much in our world with medicine. We try to fix too much in our world with psychology. We try to fix too much in our world by other means. When Christ says we change people by what? Changing their heart through salvation. Do you think that works? 
Yeah, that's how you put it aside. It works. Did you change? You know what I mean? How many in here, Frank, did you change from who you were? Right. Would the same person you are today, would we like the person you used to be? No, because that's just, but you changed. So if I have somebody that I have malice against, rather than me trying everything I can to cause them problems and to make them stumble, I should instead do what? Pray for them and try to witness to them and t bring them to Christ. Does that mean you don't have some Christians that you hate? Because when you have Christians you hate, guess who that problem starts with? You. So you have to fix you in that situation. Is there a difference between hate and dislike? Yes. Hate, I think hate means I want to destroy you at all costs. Dislike means, uh, yeah, there's some people that I, you just naturally don't like. I know that's going to shock y'all, but there's some people as a pastor I just naturally don't get along with. That's just, you know, you don't. It's not that you don't like them. It's that you have nothing in common with them. But you learn to love them anyway because Christ teaches you to love them. And even though there's not a, this, you're not on the same, you know, you don't do the same thing and enjoy the same things. And that person might rub you wrong every now and then. Because, you know, there's always just some people that just, you don't mess with. That's just life. But when I allow that to affect my decisions in the kingdom of God, that's when I'm wrong. So just because me and, say, me and James, now I like James, James likes me. This is just an example. Say, James rubbed me the wrong way, and I don't like James, but James needs me, and he calls me and says, Pastor, I need you to pray for me, and I say, no, I can't do that, I ain't got time for that. Now that dislike is bordered on what? Hatred, right? So instead, I should what? I'm going to pray for James, because he's my brother. All do you like all your family? No. Y'all, that's, <laughs> Mark was quick with that, right? I hope you ain't talking about Andy. No, yeah. <laughs> She's talking about me. I'm part of the family. Y'all realize that, right? I love you. I just don't want <laughs> But at the end of the day, we still family, right? And at the end of the day, we take care of family. So we have to put aside malice and deceit. So first we have to put aside hate, and then we have to put aside deceit. What does it mean to be deceitful? Lying and conniving. We can't be that way in the church. We can't be that way as Christians. We have to set that aside because that ruins relationships, doesn't it? Or hypocrisy. Can't be a hypocrite. That's the reason the church is where it is today. You've got too many people being hypocrites. They come in here and act like they're God's gift to, to the world on Sunday and act like a heathen come Monday. That's called hypocrisy, right? That's expecting that people bow down to you on Sunday because you're so holy and you're cussing Blue streaks come Monday. That don't work that way. That's a God you can't. God says you can't be a hypocrite. You can't be deceitful. You can't be have be full of malice. You can't be enviable. Is that hard? You think not envying other people is hard? Get in the ditch and see if it's not hard not to envy other people. Y'all understand what I mean? Get a situation in your life where you're financially strapped and you can't buy a cheeseburger. And your neighbor across the street can go out and spend money like water. And see if you don't look at it and go like this. I follow you, Jesus. And look at where I am. And them heathens across the street, they stay home on Sunday and don't go to church. And look how blessed they are. Anybody been there? We all been there. Look around. Everybody's been there, right? And at the end of the day, what we don't realize is their reward is here. And the person they're seeking is Satan, and he's rewarding them here. Because you know God's not rewarding that, right? You know, we got the misconception that God's blessing that. God don't bless a lost person because God don't know them. He, who's blessing that relationship? Satan's blessing them so they can be blinded so they don't come where? To church. As long as they have finances, as long as they got those boats and those, all those other things, that's keeping them occupied so they're not coming where? Here. So if they don't change something, what happens? They die and they go where? To hell, and what do they leave? All that stuff behind. Because the Word of God says our treasure is where? In heaven. Once again, instead of envying that person, what should we do? Pray for them and minister to them. We should go to that person and share the love of Christ with them. Because that's what he's saying. He said we can't allow that envy to keep us from impacting other people's life. 
Because when we hate you because of what you have, that means I'm not going to walk across the street to minister to you. I'm not going to see the need. I'm instead going to let you keep doing what you're doing while the, all the while I'm doing what? Look at them. They just got three new four-wheelers, honey. Right? And we can't even go buy a biscuit. The hardies. Been there? Don't act like y'all ain't been there. Everybody in here has been there. Right? We ain't got millionaires in our church. We all been there. We live in there. And it's so easy to see that and not see that that's a person. And that's what he's saying. We've got to get rid of malice. You've got to get rid of that in your heart. You've got to get rid of your, your hypocrisy. But you also got to get rid of envy and what your neighbor's got because you can't reach your neighbor if you're worried about what they got. None by their attitude. I forgot. I didn't tell you all the best part. Melinda got cussed out. Melinda got cussed out at the convenience stand by one of them. That was a melee. After y'all left, if y'all were here this morning, after y'all left the football field yesterday, we had a melee. Yeah, I'll tell you about that later. Yeah, y'all couldn't have been gone long. Yeah, y'all were y'all. Yeah, so I'll tell you when we're done. I'll tell you about the football. Remind, catch me when we're done. I'll let you know what happened afterwards. And then it says envy, and last it says slander. Does envy and slander go together? <laughs> it, it was cousins, aren't they? Because when you envy your neighbor, what do you do? You call your friend across the street and you say what? Guess what the king and queen just got? Mm, you have not been there before? Do y'all see why this can't stand? Because then your envy begins to feed your slander. And then your slander begins to feed what? Your malice. And then all of a sudden, that person across the street that needs Jesus, you're not witnessing to them because what? One, they have more than you, which causes you to talk bad about them, which in turn makes you what? Hey. That's why you can't have this stuff in, in your Christian life. Slander shouldn't apply to you. You know what kills churches? Gossip. People that run their mouth. It is amazing to me. How Maple King Baptist Church, something can happen, and it is on the street before I can get out of my office to the point I swear somebody got me bugged. But if we do something good, it don't go anywhere. Y'all ever realize that? Good news dies where the slander does what? <laughs> Gets bigger. What would happen if we flip that? That's why he said we got to put aside all this stuff because this stuff is derailing the real reason you're here. Christians aren't here to have malice. We're not here to have slander. We're not here to be envious of each other. We're here to win souls for Christ. Number one objective. And if you seek to win souls for Christ, then guess what? The malice stops. The envy stops. The slander stops. Because you're too busy working in the kingdom of God to worry about Jim and Joe's God. Instead, you're too busy worrying to try to what? Bring them to church. You know, rich people have a very high likelihood of coming to church. You know, one of the reasons I think that they don't is because we're too busy envying them and slandering them to really go and seek to share Christ with them. Because we think they got it all figured out. Right? And he says we have to put this, what? Aside. But like newborn babies. Meaning what? When you become a Christian, you're what? You're newborn. You're a baby. You, you, some of us ain't, still ain't matured in our Christian walk, right? We still drink in the milk. And it says what? Long for. Jude is a banana fanatic. And a strawberry fanatic. He longs for those things. The other day we went to the El Jalapeno. And he had half a quesadilla. He eats like a Popeye dog. Half a quesadilla. I can't remember what rice. He ate a big meal. Well, we went to Publix right there. And at Publix, they have bananas for free. You get, a, you get one fruit for free or a cookie. Well, Jude don't eat bread and Jude don't eat cookies. Jude eats fruit and vegetables. That's what he likes. He's weird. He's like a, he's on a no-carb diet and he don't even know what that is. So we walk in the store. You know what first thing Jude says? Banana. And we're like, dude, you just ate. We are not going to give you a banana. So instead, we went around and we got some strawberries and put it in the car. Well, he's just sitting in the car. Well, I turn around and me and Melinda's getting something off the shelf. We turn around and he has taken it. He couldn't pop it. You know how when you open his lid, you got to have pop. So he just slammed it. 
until it popped open. When it popped open, he had two in each hand and two in his mouth with the stems attached. Fast as he could go, trying to get new strawberries in. Why? He longs for that which he what? Loves and wants. Shouldn't we long for Christ that same way? And that's what it's saying. We long for the milk. When Jude wakes up in the morning, first thing he says is this. Nana, milk. That's the two things he wants. He wants the banana and then he wants the milk. In that order. Because he knows that's what he needs to what? Fulfill the longing. And as Christians, when we are newborn Christians and we are Christians in general, we should long for that. And this is what Peter is telling the church. You are now belong to Christ. You are now sanctified. You've got to get rid of all that other stuff. And once you get rid of all that stuff, your next step is to what? Long for pure milk of what? The Word. Long for the Word. Long to go what? To hear the Word. Long to do what? To read the Word. Long to do what? To apply the Word. That means it should be what? A desire that is insatiable. Meaning if we say we are going to teach Bible study on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday of next week, as a Christian, if you are longing to grow, where will you be? In Bible study, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Why? Because without this, you can't grow. And we have many of malnourished Christians in the world that are starving to death spiritually because they're not longing for the Word. And because they don't long for the Word, then they get caught up in malice, strife, problems with each other. They can't function because you are made to what? The Word. When Jude gets hungry, I know I'm using Jude a lot tonight, but it applies to newborn babies, and that's the closest thing I know. When he gets hungry, he goes nuts. Running all over the house, flipping off the couch, pulling over the lampshade, throwing clothes at the floor, just like a mad man. When he gets to that point, I know you've got to put him in the high chair and feed him. And now he starts doing, he learns sign language. So now he starts walking around going, e, 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 running in circles. And I'm like, dude. But he's longing for it, and because he's not having it, he's what? Angry. A lot of us are angry in our spiritual walk because we long for the word, but we're not taking in the word, so we're malnourished, and because we are malnourished, we're what? Not functioning the way we need to function. And then that makes us more likely to be hangry. Any of y'all ever been hangry? Y'all know what that is? Hungry and angry. I get that way when I'm hungry. Especially when I ain't had no carbs in a while. Me and Megan can relate. I'm going to get me a, short, a shirt that says carb life on it. Because that's what I like. And my body enjoys it. But when you get hangry, it don't matter what anybody says... Until you take a bite of whatever that Snickers bar is on the commercial, right? Or whatever it is that you bite into. And then you never notice the first bite the hangry leaves? Because it, it doesn't stay? Right? When it's something you shouldn't have, you're like a key lime pie. Cole's eating key lime pie this week. And Cole has to gain weight. Because the poor fella practices so much, he's down to like 72 pounds. And some of the kids they play with is 190. So I have to try to... I'm making him drink boost with every meal. I told him the other day you need as many honey buns as you can hold. We got to get fat. The goal is I don't want to kill you. You die, so you got to get fat. He, good thing he's fast, so they can't catch him. But when they get to where they can catch him, we're going to be in trouble. But at the end of the day, when all is said and done, when we're hangry, we can't do it. But as soon as we take that first bite, what happens? Oh, man. That's Snickers bars. Have you ever seen the commercial? They'll look like one, somebody, they take a bite and they turn it to themselves. And a lot of times as Christians, we wander around angry in our Christian life. Why? Because we're not getting the word. And isn't it funny that Peter said the, before, you're aliens and you're sanctified. And then he says, but therefore, because you're aliens and because you're sanctified, you got to put aside all this stuff that's going to hinder you. But then you got to do what? Get in the word. Get into what I tell you because the Word is going to create in you the person that you need to be. And he says, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. 
So did he say you should grow in this respect to height? No, did he say you should grow in respect to weight? He's not talking about physical stuff. What he's saying is that you do this so that you may grow in respect to what? Your salvation. You should grow in your walk in Christ through the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe and know that our churches today are probably the most malnourished spiritually that there has ever been? If I said this, I got a test. Y'all bring that test out. We're going to take a biblical quiz. Some of y'all will cut, turn the color of that wall. Why? Because we're not confident in the way that we read our scripture. Right? And it's, it's something that we have to develop and grow at. There's some things that right now as a child, my children can't do. do the babies, do they, are they born walking? No, they have to grow in that respect. And we've got many of Christians that have, they're basically stunted in their growth because they have gotten here, they have gotten saved. That means they're going to be in heaven. I believe they're sanctified. I believe they have all the, the possibilities to be the best Christian in the world. But they have stopped growing because they have stopped been feeding the word and they just what? They're stunted. Right? They're immature. They're just floundering. And when you're in that state, if you look like a child, in a Christian world, you're going to act like what? A child. The kids handle conflict well? No. Right? They don't know how to do that. So when you have fighting in the church amongst Christians, it's due to the fact that those Christians aren't what? Mature. Because mature Christians do what? Handle themselves the way mature people handle themselves. Does that mean every time you're... No. There's going to come times that people just going to get you. You're human. There's times that I'm more likely to be gotten than others. Don't call me before 8 o'clock in the morning if there's some great question that needs to be asked or my brain ain't going to what? Function. Is anybody else like that? i got to have coffee. My Fitbit registers, I sleep about five hours a night on a good night. So when I get up, I have to actually drink some coffee in order to what? Get it all going. Don't call me with some philosophical, wait till 8. If the world now, if the world's going to die and you're going to you're going to be going to your maker, call me beforehand. But if it can possibly wait, I got I laugh all the time. We get people to call me about church things at twelve thirty at night at work, texting. I want to text back. You need to go to bed. It's too early in the morning, right? That's fine though. I'm up, so text me all night long. Just in the morning, give me let me have, send this text, Pastor. Have you had your coffee? And I'll send back no. Then you'll say, well, tell me when you have. <laughs> if it's a... Yeah, that's what Melinda Megan always puts. I hope this hasn't woke you up. No, 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 well, I'm up. <laughs> then she goes, but can this and that and that and that. And I'm always like, come on. I'm just going to start sending back a picture of a cup of coffee to <laughs> Megan. And said, but not yet. I did that all for Megan's benefit because she likes to get up at 5 o'clock and text. But it says that what? We have to grow. But there's going to be times that we might not be strong. But if we're strong spiritually, then we're going to be what? Strong. We're going to be where we need to be. And it says, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So it's saying once you have tasted Christ, you should then what? Long for the milk. Do you have to teach a baby to drink milk? Huh? No, that's what? Once they taste it, guess what? It's on. So in the same respect, us as Christians should have to, once we should taste the, who Christ is, it should give us a desire. So if we don't have the desire, then we really have the conversion. Hmm. What do you think? You know what I mean? If you don't have the desire... Did you come to know Christ when you said you come to know Christ? Or were you making an emotional decision? Because you know people come to Christ with emotional decision. We do it every year with Vacation Bible School. We heard a bunch of kids together. We share the plan of salvation. One little Johnny stands up or four of his crew. Because you know they get them crews there in Vacation Bible School. It's like little games. His little crew's going to get up and go with him. Why? Because little Johnny might have been converted. But the rest of that crowd sees the, the attention that little Johnny gets and they ain't getting no attention at home. So they stand it up and they convert and make it professing to Christ and vacation Bible school. Does that mean we stop doing it? No. It just means that we have to be diligent to make sure that little Johnny knows that he knows. 
than they can tell you what sin is. Because I believe we have a church full of people that made an emotional decision years ago and are clinging to that emotional decision, but they have not grown. And they have tasted the milk of Christ, but they have not grown because they really don't know who Christ is. It all comes back. I told you about that book I'm reading. I know some of y'all, I think you're reading it. Unsaved Christian. Mom, her mom read it. Her mom's trying to get some enlightenment. Maybe she'll share it with you when she's done. That book will open your eyes to why we have people that say they're Christians but don't act like it. Because they are so convinced in their salvation because we live in the Bible now. We live in a plain area of the country that there is a church on every corner. People understand prayer because we have seen prayer our whole lives. But do we truly know the one we're praying to? And that's the question we have to ask because the Word of God just says, Peter just said that if you have tasted Christ, then you're going to what? Long for them. Does that mean every day you go long? No. I'm not saying that every day you're just, you might, but and I think the more you read, the more you long for it. There's times in my spiritual life, even to this day, and I prepare lessons every week to come talk to you guys, that I don't want to read the Bible. I'm just being real with y'all. And if there's a pastor out there that says they wake up every day just foaming in the mouth and read the word, they liars. Because life happens. And there's sometimes even in my spiritual walk where I have to get this Bible and sit down even when I don't want to read it. And I have to do what? Read it. But when I begin to read it, guess what happens? Then I begin to get a desire. So that which I thought I would do for 10 minutes turns into an hour. Right? So it's there. It's just sometimes we're not going to be all... It's like sometimes I might not want a piece of chocolate cake. Now 9.99 times I'm going to want the chocolate cake. Right? But there's some times that I don't want to. But once I taste it, guess what? It's gone. It's done. Right? It's a done deal. Same thing in the kingdom of God. There's going to be times that you struggle to read. But you got to read. Because once you get a taste for it, then you're going to what? Develop a longing for it. And when you begin to develop a longing for the Word of God and you interject that into your lives, it changes who you are. And if our churches are full of people that are not changed, it's because of two reasons. One, they didn't know Christ to start with. Or number two, they're not eating, drinking enough of the Word. And you can't come on Sunday morning and get enough of the Word to last you for a whole week. Can you eat one meal a day and last you for the whole week? We got that misconception. Can you intermittently fast in the kingdom of God? That's a big thing today, right? Everybody wants to intermittently fast. Not religiously fast. We can't do that anymore. But now we've become mainstream by being intermittently fasting. But you can't eat one meal and expect it to what? Reach the whole week. You got to do what? Consume it daily. How many times a day do you eat? Some people eat one. But when I eat one meal a day, guess what? It's a meal. Right? So when you eat that one meal a day, it can't be just a 10-minute meal. You've got to eat what? A meal. Like sometimes when people at work look at me weird. When I fast and I go back to work, 12 o'clock at night a lot of times I'm done. Now I eat like two burritos, some nachos and cheese, two or three granola bars. Drink two or three. They're looking at me like, my gosh. And I'm like, I had not ate today. What's wrong with y'all? This is my whole meal. I'm trying to get it all in one time. But just like our body needs food, what? Throughout the day, our spiritual body needs food when? Throughout the day. It amazes me at how much, how little we long for the Word daily. I'm going to give you some examples today. We're probably not going to further than that because this stuff is just like, there's so much in those first few verses. I'm going to give you some realistic ways to interject Christ more in your life. Number one, I believe this to be true. I had somebody come up and tell me this today because I had advised them to do that. I give out good advice every now and then. To read the Word in the morning. Set your, set your alarm clock for an hour early. If you can't give an hour to the man that died on the cross for your sin, something's wrong. Hour early. Now, although some of y'all get up at 5, so 4 o'clock would be a little early, but tell Jesus that when y'all get to heaven. Get up early. When it is quiet in your house, and read the Word. Jesus started every day off by reading the Word of prayer. And if Jesus is, did Jesus have to? He was the Word. He didn't do that so that we, because He needed it, Jesus did that, why? So we have an example of what we need to do. Start your day with the Word. Start your day 
with prayer. End your day with a word. That means putting a little snotty those kids to bed. And when you do, before you do anything else, do the work. Because a lot of times what we do is we're going to put the kids to bed. And then I'm going to handle some things that I want to do. I'm going to fold some clothes. I'm going to vacuum the floor. Uh, I'm, I'm going to eat me a piece of pie. I'm watching a little of my TV shows, right? I can't watch my TV shows because they're so bad for my children. So I'm going to watch them when they're asleep. Should Christians be watching shows? I ain't even going to go there. I ain't even going to go there. Y'all know what that sermon is. Instead of doing that, because what happens is we do all that and then you fall asleep because you're exhausted in the middle of whatever soap opera you're watching the reruns for or whatever it is that you're watching on TV, and then you go to bed and the Word had not been read, right? You had not had your nightly meal before bed. So instead, when the little kids go to sleep and the husband is batting down, get your Word and read it. Now, once you're done, guess what? You can go do whatever you want to do, but Jesus ain't going to let you watch that bad show that you can't watch with your children because you just read the Word. So I'm going to ruin some of y'all's Hulu night. Y'all's Netflix and chills going out the, out the window. Jesus. The younger crowd's up and going. <laughs> End your day with the Word. So we've started our day with the Word. We've ended our day with the Word. Guess what we have in the middle of the day? Y'all eat lunch? In the middle of the day, you need a tune-up, right? Find some way in the middle of the day to read the Word. Now, I know you can't sit down and do the extent that you do in the morning and the extent you do at night. So make you some index cards of a verse or two for the week and memorize that verse on your lunch. That might mean just read it a couple times. Something that you like, something that's easy to memorize. You know, we ask in Awana for our kids to memorize Bible verses. And it's a shame that they memorize Bible verses, but as adults, we don't. Write it down. It doesn't have to be nothing extensive. But when you memorize that, now you're taking the Word and you're putting it where? You're refocusing yourself. Does everybody eat an afternoon snack? Do y'all eat snacks? Right? I'm going to give you the example for your snack. They have an interesting thing now called podcasts. Right? It's kind of like throwback radio, but they don't advertise it that way. Some of you older folks in here that used to be there where you have to listen to the TV show on the radio, who did that? Go ahead and all it, honey. At the end of the day, podcast is old school radio. And you can go on your podcast and you can get preaching. It's amazing. And you can have a sermon on there. Most of the time, they're only 20 minutes. Andy Stanley, who is Charles Stanley's son, has a fantastic channel that they have. They're about 20 minutes. And as you're driving home from work, instead of listening to your radio and them songs, because you know, the, I know some people say, well, I listen to Christian music on the way home. Yeah, but you hear it so much, you're not listening to the words. So it's not impacting you. Instead, do what? Put on the word. A pastor preaching. I can give you a list. Tony Evans is fantastic. Charles Stanley is fantastic. Um, Andy Stanley is fantastic. Ask me and I can tell you the ones that ain't fantastic. I won't tell you out loud, but they're something you got to be aware of. But take those that you are because every day they're going to put what? A sermon on that podcast. Sometimes I listen to 30 sermons a week. Me and Colby riding in the car listening to a sermon. Or they make this thing called Audible. That has Christian books on it. So you can listen to it as well. So instead of physically reading the word on the, on the afternoon on the way home, I'm going to put on a podcast and it's going to what? Reaffirm who I am in Christ. So that's four times in that day that I have what? Interjected the word into my life. Do you believe you'll grow? You can't help but grow. That's the problem. That's what the word of God says is because you are doing it, you are going to grow. If I give my baby milk, will it grow? Unless there is something horribly wrong, that baby is going to what? Grow. It has no choice but to grow. So if you're not growing spiritually, it's because you don't want to grow spiritually. Because we like everything else more than we like Christ. We don't have that longing. True? Oh, I fall into this. I fall into this. It's a struggle for me to have that incentive to be able to cut this to have that incentive to be able, I'm not going to take it all, but we do. To have that incentive to what? 
grow in Scripture. Try this. I want to issue a challenge. Everybody in here, do that for the next week. Just for the week. I use an app called Podbean. If you've got an uh, iPhone app, you can get an app. But Podbean is something I use because it's just easy to find everything on it. Bean. I'll show you the app. Mm -hmm. Like a bean in a pod. You know? <laughs> and just try it. Say, I'm going to give up the radio this week. And instead, I'm going to listen to sermons. Thank you. 